You know, we are a blessed church. I, I, I look around and you know, we have an incredible worship team. God has blessed our church for the church of the size that we are to have as many people gifted, so gifted musically. Um, you know, just about every time we do communion and, and one of the, the people plays, they're almost all original compositions that God has just blessed him with and they in turn are blessing our congregation with. Um, we, we are, God has been so generous and gracious to this congregation. We need to keep that in mind because he has blessed us. Um, I do have an ask the pastor question. I'm not going to answer it today. The person that asked it is not here, so I'll save it until they're here. Um, I have a number of scriptures that I want to read to you. Uh, if you want to write them down, I'll, I'll go slow. I don't expect you to try and keep up with flipping through your Bible, but, but please write them down so you can look uh, at your leisure and look them up. I'm going to jump around. There's, there's a number of points that I want to make. Um, before we get into today's message, there's, there's a, a subject that I feel like needs to be addressed. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says, Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Keep a close watch. Look intently at your life and, and at what you're teaching. Persist in this. Press in on this. Keep doing this. For by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. No, Paul's not telling Timothy that if you keep a close watch on yourself, you'll somehow save yourself. We know there's no salvation apart from the cross. But if he's watching his teaching, he's going to be preaching the cross. He's going to be teaching those things that are in line with God's will and His Word. Proverbs uh, 30, verse 5. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. says, Every word of God proves true. Another translation says, Every word of God is pure. Now, we have the Word of God, don't we? What God saw fit to give us, this is sufficient. This, this was enough. You know, God, there's no way this could contain everything. God is infinite. John even writes at the end of his Gospel that if he tried to include everything that Jesus did in just the ministry that he had here on this earth, there wouldn't be enough paper to cover it all. So this, this is not everything. It's enough. It's enough. Paul writing to the Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. He also writes in the first book of Thessalonians, his first letter to them, chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. He says, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. And abstain from every form of evil. Speaking prophetically, Paul writes to Timothy. There's two passages that I'm going to read. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. He says, But understand this, 
that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now here's where, where I, I really want you to draw your attention. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sin and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Later in chapter 4 of the same book, verses 3 and 4, he says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. One of the passages of Scripture that God gave me when He brought me into ministry, when He told me that I was going to be a pastor, was the passage in Ezekiel about a watchman. And I, and I think in measure, <clears throat> every pastor is by their very calling a watchman. And a watchman is posted on the wall up in the tower. And while the city is carrying on their business or sleeping in their beds, the watchman is watching. And he takes note when somebody comes to the wall. And his job is to give warning. His job is to give warning. It's not his job to make the people respond. It's his job to give warning. If he fails to give warning, the blood of the people is on his head. But if he gives warning and the people do not respond, their blood is on their own head. So this morning, I, I had several people ask me a comment. I posted a thing on Facebook, uh, Thursday, Friday, I don't remember which day, the movie The Shack came out. And I, I want to address why I will not be seeing this movie and why I am encouraging you not to see this movie. Okay, The, the article that I posted um, lists 13 heresies. Heresies. Do you understand what that word means? This is something that speaks in direct contravention to the Word of God, claiming in some manner to be under the auspice of God. For example, one of the heresies of the, the church was tritheism. Uh, this is a heresy that pops up periodically. Uh, even, even a few years ago, this was, was, was uh, in the church, in, in the prosperity movement. <coughs> The idea being that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are three unique individuals, which they are, that's Trinity, Trinitarianism, but that they are unique unto themselves, each having their own body, their own soul, their own spirit. That's tritheism. That is not what Scripture says. Scripture says that God is spirit. He has no body such as we do, no corporal form such as we do. So, so a heresy is something that is proclaiming to be true and yet is not. Okay? Now, I read the shack. Uh, it was given to me 
by my brother who thought it was a very good book. I read the book and, and uh, without a doubt it deals with a gut-wrenching, heartbreaking, emotional subject. But I want to caution you today, we cannot be swept up in gut-wrenching, heartbreaking, emotional things. Especially when those things weave insidiously in the telling lies and heresies. I read those scriptures because this is just a shadow of what is going on. The shack is purported it was distributed to, targeted at Christian audiences. And yet the things that it proclaims in its writings are contrary to what scripture says. They fly in the face of what God has said to be true in the holy writ of His Word. People say, well, it's just an allegory. No, it's not an allegory. When God gave us the original Ten Commandments, He said, you shall make no graven images of Me. None. There's a reason for that. One, because we could never put into image what God is like. He is unique among all things because apart from God, everything else is created. He is uncreated. He is the eternally self-existent One. And what could even the greatest artisan create that would not in some way diminish God. The book, the movie, anthropomorphizes God. It puts Him in a, the Father in a bodily form. Scripture says we don't do that. As a matter of fact, I want to read a passage out of Romans. Chapter 1. Turn with there with me if you would. Romans chapter 1. We're going to pick up starting in verse 18. <clears throat> For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. <clears throat> Did you catch that? If it's not truth revealing, it's unrighteous. Unrighteousness suppresses the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. <clears throat> Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man. I have heard interviews, I've read papers, I've read interviews, I've done research on the writer, I believe his name is Paul Young, 
I've heard his history, heard his background. Uh, it grieves my heart to know that when he was writing this book, the two characters that he said represented himself were Mac and the little girl who was killed. And it, it grieves my heart to know that he would suffer such hardship that that's how he would see himself. However, that does not excuse what he chose to write. First, God has said in his word that he is invisible, that he is spirit, that, that we cannot in any way and should not in any way try to make an image of him. The book has done this. The Holy Spirit, they didn't call it the Holy Spirit because it was something other than the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a spirit, not a little Asian one. God has said in His Word that there is an order, there is a hierarchy to the way He does things. It says that God is a God of order. Jesus said that He was sent of God. That He submitted Himself to the will of the Father. He said that the Father will send you the Spirit. And later He said, I will send you the Spirit. There is a clear order, a clear hierarchy. Does that mean one is more valuable than the other? No. It means that they submit themselves that the whole would be better. See, this is part of the problem in the church today. Everybody is so concerned about self and that, that we would receive the accolades that we fail to knit together and work, that the body of Christ, whom Christ is the head, would receive the accolades. It's not about me. That's the whole thing Jesus was teaching us when He was here on the earth. It's not about you. It's about God. And, and, and an amazing, incredible, awesome God He is. The shack says there is no hierarchy. That each submits to the other. That's, that is a direct contravention to what Scripture says. Perhaps most troubling to me of all is that all men are saved because of the cross. That's not what Scripture says. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10 Flip there with, with me, if you would. Ephesians chapter 2. Paul is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, For by grace you have been saved. And if we stopped right there, there could be some validity to what the shack is saying. By the way, just, just as a point of reference, the book is not called The Shack. Did anybody read the title? It's The Shack Uncovered. Everybody calls it The Shack. That's not the title. Just point of pee. Thank you for that little segment. <laughs> Getting right back. <coughs> for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Everybody knows John 3.16. Quote it, please. Who has everlasting life? Those who believe. Those who believe. Those who believe. Last week, 
We had an ask the pastor question that what is the unforgivable sin? The only sin that is unforgivable is unbelief. Scripture tells us that all sin will be forgiven. But there is one that will not be forgiven. And that's when the Pharisees came to Jesus and, and He spoke to them about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. What were they doing? They were not believing what He said. So there are those who are not going to be saved. A direct result of this idea... <coughs> excuse me. that all men would be saved, is that if all men are going to be saved, there is no punishment for sin. If there is no punishment for sin, why did Jesus go to the cross? The cross is absolutely unnecessary. If there were any other way that we could be redeemed, there would be no need for the cross. And if this doesn't rile you up and offend you on behalf of God, who from the foundation of the world determined that His Son would die on the cross, and somebody has the audacity to market a writing to the Christians who says that that was not necessary, that should make you angry. And it should make you angry that people are taking this book and picking it up and studying it and they're taking this one and closing it and setting it aside. They are exchanging the truth of God for a lie. And it breaks my heart that people I went to Bible school with had studies on the book The Shack Uncovered. And they laid down the scripture and they picked up a lie. Anybody that says that the cross is not necessary stands before the righteous judgment of God. And they stand uncovered. We all will stand before Him, but thank God, when I stand before Him, I am covered with the blood of His Son. Amen. And that when I stand before Him, He does not look at me, but He sees His Son. I thank God for that. That should strike fear into our hearts that people that we know and love are someday going to stand before God and unless they be saved, they would stand before Him uncovered. And it scares me that this book that is now a movie is accepted and embraced by the evangelical Christian world as being inspired I will tell you the truth right now. It is inspired, but it is not inspired of God. Because God does not contradict Himself. God does not say yes, yes, and no, no. And it horrifies me that the church in America is so biblically illiterate and so doctrinally stupid that they can read this and go, oh, this has done more for me than three years of seminary. What school did you go to? It makes me shake with fear that Christians think so little of the truth of God and His Word that they poo-poo the discrepancies. Do you think God poo-poos the discrepancies? Do you think God is willing to overlook that this is being called a lie? God help us. God help us. That in the generosity that He has poured out on us, we have become so lazy and so ignorant that a lie can so easily throw us off track. Guys, the church in America is in trouble. That a work of fiction, what is by its own admission, a work of fiction, 
is given such credibility in spite of it so contradicting this word. There were things, I, I tell you when I read the book, there were things that moved me about the book. It, 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 it horrifies any, any father, especially of little girls, <coughs> would be horrified at the thought of their daughter being kidnapped and brutalized and murdered. That's, that's gut-wrenching. And anybody in their right mind could not help but be moved that God would intervene directly to heal this father. But people, we cannot let the emotion cloud the issue. We cannot let the tugging of the heart string cloud the reality and the truth of what God says. We have got to know His Word. So that when heresy rears its ugly head, we can be quick to strike it down. That we would not be. The word says that in the last days, if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. That's how bad it's going to get. That's how desperate it's going to get. It's going to be hard to tell the truth. And if you are not so knit up into this Word and have it so ingrained into your thinking, into your heart, into your life, it is going to be hard to discern truth. So I will not be seeing the shack. I am encouraging you. I'm encouraging you. Don't go see the shack. Don't support this kind of Christian money making. There are movies that are much more worth your money. There are so many things that are coming out now. Hollywood has finally realized, hey, Christians want good moral stories. You want to go see a good movie? Go see Return to Zion. You guys don't even know what that is, do you? That's the, that's the movie Nick and the, the Backwoods Boys just finished making. It'll be out, what, March 9th? What? April. April 9th. April 9th. So, um, but but I, I just I, I, people, if I fail to give a word, I am responsible before God. I'm responsible before God, and I would rather stand up here. Whoa! <laughs> Catch me, Tim. <laughs> And give warning and find out, nope, 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 they're friends, they're friends, it's okay. Then stand down there and go, well, I think they're okay. And find out that somebody stumbled and fell. Amen? Amen. I'm just going to touch on one thing real quick here. Um, last week, we spoke about holiness. We spoke about positional holiness. We spoke about practical holiness. Positional holiness is what we have the moment we surrender our lives to Christ and we have received the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That, that's positional holiness, that we stand before God, not in our own righteousness, which is His filthy rags, but in His righteousness. That he, he dresses us in robes of white raiment. That's positional holiness. That, that nothing can change that. Okay? When, when Jesus went to the cross, all our sin, past, present, future, forgiven. Okay? Nothing is going to change that. However, there is practical holiness. This is the process of sanctification where we start working out in our lives the living of that holiness. Uh, I want to read a, a quote. <clears throat> this is by J.C. Ryle. He was uh, part of the Puritan movement. Um, he says, Does anyone ask me what we may expect to see in a true conversion? I reply, There will always be something seen in a converted man's character, feelings, conduct, opinions, and daily life. You will not see in him perfection, but you will see in him something peculiar distinct 
and different from other people. You will see him hating sin, loving Christ, following after holiness, taking pleasure in his Bible, persevering in prayer. You will see him penitent, humble, believing, temperate, charitable, truthful, good-tempered, patient, upright, honorable, kind. These, at any rate, will be his aims. These are the things which he will follow after, however short he may come of perfection. In some converted people, you will see these things more distinctly, in others less. This only I say, wherever there is conversion, something of this kind will be seen. Folks, God has called us to a life of holiness. Now, what, what is holiness? First, we need to understand that God is holy. Holy is the only word that we can really use to describe Him because He is so unique. He's different from everything else. His, his righteousness is absolutely perfect. He has never sinned. He is incapable of sinning. He is unique. He is separate. Okay? And when He calls us, He calls us to be holy as He is holy. Now, positionally, we know that holiness comes only through the blood of Christ. Only as a direct result of the cross. That's positional. But practical. The practicing of holiness is something that we never stop doing. He has sent us His Holy Spirit. He has gifted us with His Holy Spirit that the process of holiness would be ongoing. But see, here's where we come to a dilemma, folks. In order to be unique like God, we cannot be profane like the world. We can't be the same as they are because we are no longer of them. We are different. God has called us and pulled us out. We are no longer profane. We're no longer common. We're no longer unholy. But we are separated unto holiness, unto God. And we walk in that holiness. Now that's not to say we're not going to stumble. Scripture says we're going to stumble. Okay? But we don't continue stumbling just because we are. We never reconcile to ourselves, this, this is just the way it's going to be. That's a lie. If that were the way it was going to be, He wouldn't call us to practice holiness. There would not be a process whereby we would become holy. Folks, if there is a place in your life that you have just thrown up your hands and said, well, this is the way it is. And it is contrary to holiness. It is contrary to what God says. If it in any way resembles what the world has accepted as true, get on your face before God. Cry out to Him. Call out to the Almighty God. I think of David when he sinned with Bathsheba. David, a man after God's own heart. And he blew it as big as you can blow it. Because not only did he, did he commit adultery, but he compounded it because he tried to put the blame or the credit at Uriah's feet. And when Uriah proved to be a more righteous man than he was, he had him killed. And so in an effort to hide and maintain his self-righteousness, he became a sinner. And I think about him when Nathan came and confronted him and he told him, you are this man. And the Spirit of God fell on him. And he rent his clothes and he wept and he would not eat. And the punishment, he was going to lose his son. And he wept before God and he refused to eat. He fasted and he prayed. But when the son died, what did he do? He got up and he cleaned himself up. And they said, what is this? And he said, I had hope that while, while the child was alive, God might relent in his anger. But God has taken him and I will see him again. 
See, David just didn't give up in despair and throw his arms up and say, oh, well. No, he had a hope greater than that. He had a, a hope that was and is being fulfilled because he knew that at some point he would be with his son. So people, I want to challenge you today. We all have areas that we struggle with, every one of us. But we cannot afford to reach an accommodation with sin. We cannot look at and be like the world. We have got to be different because God has called us to be different because God is different. And we're His. Father, I bless you this morning. Father, you have not given us a charge and then left us alone to accomplish it. <coughs> you say that you've given us everything we need that pertains to godliness, righteousness. You have given us your Holy Spirit that convicts us of sin that teaches us your word, that reveals to us those things we need to know. Father, you have created the body of Christ so that we could help one another. That we could share each other's burdens. That, Father, we might even <coughs> exhort one another. Turn each other away from sin that those who are strong would strengthen the weak. Father, I ask that we would have humble hearts before you today. God, that there would be nothing in our lives that would separate us from you. Father, let us not embrace anything that would be apart from your desire, your heart. Give us strength, Father, that we might stand. We honor you this morning, Father, in Jesus' name.